First, we have shirts, and we'll give those out tomorrow and Friday, if you're here for the shirts. If you're here for the knowledge, today our speaker is Sertesh Karaman. He is a professor here at MIT in the Aero Asteroid Department. He builds and studies autonomous vehicles that move on land and in the air. That includes ones that have 18 wheels and two wheels and everything in between. Robots that move fast and aggressively and robots that move slowly and safely. He takes both the formal optimization-based approach and the data-driven deep learning approach to robotics. He's a mentor to me and many other researchers here at MIT and beyond. And while he is uh, one of the leading experts in the world in building autonomous vehicles, uh, for the nerds out there, he still programs. He programs on a Kinesis keyboard, uses Emacs, which is how you know he's legit. So please, uh, <laughs> thanks. Please give a warm welcome to Sir Tesh. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Lex. I, I, I really had the pleasure to work with Lex uh, for some time, and it seems like this class is him and the TAs have put together some amazing class. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Um, he gave me this title, Past, Present, Future of Motion Planning or something. Uh, hopefully that's not quite exactly what you were expecting. So I took a whole bunch of slides from uh, different talks and put them together. And I am hoping to just kind of go through all, you know, as much as I can uh, to tell you uh, some of the interesting things I think in the domain that's happening and touch upon motion planning at some point. Um, maybe a good starting point would be to tell you a little bit about my background. Um, it is exactly a decade, probably today, that I shook John Leonard's hand, who you've met before. I shook John Leonard's hand as a graduate student and joined the DARPA Urban Challenge team. It's been exactly a decade uh, off of it. Uh, we worked through it um, with a number of people. Some of them are in the audience. I can count some. Um, and the, at the time that we were doing these kind of things, Back in the day, it was an academic project. You can look at the DARPA Urban Challenge teams and you'll recognize they're all university teams, at least all the finishers. Um, and it came from an academic project to the thing that's going to change the world in 10 years. So I hope to give you a bit of a history and, and, and some, some thoughts on that as well, okay? Let me start with my background. So I started graduate school with this. Uh, we built these beasts that I'm going to talk to you about a little bit. I wonder if John Leonard talked at all, but I'll give you some details. Uh, this was our entry to the DARPA Urban Challenge. Uh, it was a Land Rover LR3 that we made autonomous that navigated through that course, and it was one of the six finishers. Um, a number of my friends you know, went out and they did their own careers. Um, uh, with a number of others, we stayed here at MIT. We built a number of other autonomous vehicles. Let me show you. Um, one thing that we have done that um, I was kind of doing, the, I was the motion planning lead for, uh, was this autonomous forklift. It was a forklift that you could literally take a megaphone and speak to. You could say forklift, go to XYZ, and it would go to that location. Here it's trying to go to receiving, which happens to be an area where trucks pull up with pallets on it so that you can kind of pick these pallets up and, and you can put them elsewhere. So it's going to go there, it has a front camera, it looks through that camera, it beams that camera image to a handheld tablet device made by Nokia. Back in the day, there was a company called Nokia they would make these phones and handheld devices so you could see what it's seeing. You would circle so you didn't have tapping back then, but you had these pen gestures, you could circle something and the thing would scan it and, and take a look at it. Um, you could... So, you know, it'll, let me just kind of go through this because it's kind of a bit slow. So it'll scan through the palette, it'll pick it up, but one thing I would like to show you guys is that once that's done, you can, you can also talk to a tablet. The tablet would recognize your voice and then it would command the robot to do that kind of thing. Uh, this was before autonomous cars, before iPhone, before, I don't know, Alexa, before uh, Siri and things like that, okay? Um, so I spent like a couple of years kind of doing this type of project that really shaped up my PhD thesis. And later when I started as a faculty, I also worked on a number of things, so let me show you one. We built like autonomous golf carts in, uh, in Singapore's uh, NUS, National University of Singapore campuses. Uh, to go there and do mobility on demand and so on. Um, the one thing that I ended up doing there was throughout these projects, I focused mainly on motion planning that you were expecting. Uh, the one algorithm that I was working on was called Rapidly Exploring Random Tree. The idea is quite simple. So you're starting um, in the middle of 
of, so this is the area that you're looking at. There is that orange dot that you're starting from. You want to go to the magenta goal region. There's these red obstacles. You want to find the path that starts from the initial condition, goes to the goal. That's the very basic motion planning problem. Turns out this problem is computationally pretty challenging, especially as the number of dimensions of this problem is two dimensional. But if you increase the number of dimensions, you can prove that any complete algorithm, meaning any algorithm that returns a solution when one exists and returns failure otherwise, will scale exponentially its computation time. So at some point, you're going to run out of memory or time to do these things. The algorithm that I was working on was called Rapidly Exploring Random Tree. The idea is simple. You just land down a bunch of samples. Every time you put like a random sample, you connect it to the, to the nearest node in a tree of trajectories that you're building. And in this way, you sort of rapidly explore the state space to find a whole bunch of paths. Some of these paths may reach the goal, so those, that's the path that you pick. So it's going to run in a second. As you can see, it's just sampling the environment, trying to build this set of trajectories that don't collide the obstacles. If your trajectory collides with an obstacle, you just kind of delete it, and you move on with other samples, and then you would build this kind of a tree, okay? Um, it's an algorithm that's kind of pretty widely used, and, and it goes well beyond these kind of simple cases. For example, in our urban challenge kind of entry, uh, we were using this algorithm. So here you're seeing the algorithm in action. So we're trying to park at a location uh, during what DARPA called the NQE event. So you can see a whole bunch of cars that our vehicle is seeing generating this map. Uh, red are obstacles, black is the drivable region. It's going to try to park into it, and then it's going to unpark. You're seeing something hairy here. So that's a set of trajectories that are generated by the robot, by the RRT algorithm. So it's trying to unpark now, go there. So as you can see, the trajectories are going back and then going towards that obstacle. So it's just generating these trajectories, picking the best one. So we've used this algorithm throughout the race. It worked OK. So you can see the performance as it's running. Uh, so this is a video, that, video that's made about 30 times faster, kind of showing you how the thing works. Um, when we switched to the forklift kind of algorithm, uh, forklift platform, um, I started working on this. Um, and the one thing that we realized is that, you know, the, the forklift tries to go here to park in front of a truck, and it finds this trajectory. At some point, it discovers there's an obstacle here, and it finds this looping trajectory, and, and it never gets out of that loop. You would think that it's trying to minimize the path length, so you would think that it would be easier to come up with something that just kind of turns left and aligns. But it turns out that once you have that loop, even if you add more samples to it, you're stuck with that loop. And so you would never improve this type of trajectory. So um, back in the day, um, Professor Seth Teller, um, who passed away, unfortunately, a couple of years ago, but he really pushed me. He was telling me this doesn't work, and every time it just makes this loop right in front of the army generals who are the sponsor, and it just looks ridiculous. You need to fix this kind of thing. And trying to find the fix for it, we realized that the algorithm actually has some fundamental flaws in it. Um, so specifically, we were able to kind of write down a formal proof that the RRT algorithm actually fails to converge to optimal solutions. So this is kind of something interesting. So you would think that if you add more samples, you would get better and better trajectories. But it turns out that the first few trajectories that you found, it just constrains you. So it closes the, the, the space that you want to search. And you're stuck with bad trajectories. And this almost always happens. Sometimes you're lucky. Your bad trajectory is kind of good enough. But most of the time, it's pretty bad. We were able to come up with another algorithm that we called RRT star, which just does a little bit more work, but guarantees asymptotic optimality, meaning it will always converge to optimum solutions. And the difference, the computational difference between the two is very little. If you were to run them side by side, RRT star tree would look like this. What it's doing is it's, it's just looking at the paths locally, and it's just kind of correcting them locally just a little bit. And that little bit correction is enough to converge to globally optimal trajectories. So that turned out to be my doctoral thesis back in 2011, and we applied it to a number of things. Let me show you one simulation scenario. Imagine a race car coming into like a turn, wants to turn very quickly, <coughs> generates these trajectories. So the right thing to do is to kind of slow down a little bit, start skidding, hit one end of the road, now start speeding up, and go as fast as possible so that you hit the other end of the road and you complete the turn. These kind of things would come out just naturally from the algorithm. OK, you wouldn't have to program. You have to do these kind of things, but you just run the algorithm, and these are the, this is the best trajectory it finds. It would be, it would be impossible to get something like this from an RRT. Um, we applied it to a number of other robots as well. I don't know, like um, 
PR2 type robots or, or these autonomous forklifts and got good results out of it. So that kind of maybe gives you a bit of an idea of my background, meaning like my graduate school experience a little bit and, and the PhD. Let me kind of tell you a bit quickly what my research group does. Um, so I always say sort of, um, so we do a lot of things um, in a fortunate and unfortunate way. So it's hard to find the focus sometimes, admittedly. Um, but I usually tell people that we work on autonomous vehicles. The problem is quite interesting, both at the vehicle level, meaning how are you going to build these autonomous vehicles individually, and also interesting at a systems level. When you think about it, most of the autonomous vehicle is most valuable if you put them into a system that they can work. Let me give you some examples. Um, so a system of autonomous vehicles would be, for example, this Kiva system scenario. You know, nowadays you buy something from Amazon, the way it's, you buy two books, the way it's packed is that books are brought by robots to a picker and the picker just puts them into the same box and sends it to you. So this is done by 500 autonomous vehicles, for example. That would be a good example of a system. Another one is that there are ports around there in the world you know, that are working just completely with autonomous vehicles and cranes. If you project a little bit forward, you can think maybe you, know, you can have drone delivery systems and, and they maybe don't have enough batteries so they have to relay packages to one another so you need to build a system of autonomous vehicles. Or if you have, I don't know, like autonomous cars, maybe it's best to use them in like an Uber-like scenario so you can have autonomous taxis that they can work together and such. So let me tell you a bit more on the vehicle level problems and the system level problems, some of the crazy things that we try to do. On the vehicle level, we're interested in all aspects of both perception and, and planning. Usually the challenges are sort of either complexity or um, either computational complexity. So you, it's very hard just computationally, so you really need to innovate. Or it's just the system becomes very complex, so you need to figure that out. Um, we're, for example, recently motivated by really fast and agile kind of vehicles, how we can build that. Like one thing that we were motivated, for example, is sort of like imagine there's a drone flying and you want to you want to catch it in the fly? I wonder if this is going to play. So, you know, it turns out that Netherlands police is, so people fly UAVs around, and you somehow want to take it down. It's not like you can shoot at it. So people train eagles and things like that. So we thought it would be great to actually build these types of robots that we try to in our group. Um, so you can, once you start to do these kind of things, you wonder, like, how much I can push the boundaries of very, very agile vehicles and systems. So here you're going to see a falcon diving for a prey. Um, you're going to see a goose right at the last like a split second. So if you look at the scene from a 20 hertz camera, this is what you would see. So they are definitely much faster. They do very complicated you know, planning and maneuvering to be able to do these kind of things. So you know, in the research group, we look at a number of different perception problems where you have multi-agents, you have ultra high rate cameras. Like for example, we have drones with 200 hertz cameras on them. Um, and so you're trying to understand the person that you're tracking, its dynamics, its intentions. On the control level, you're trying to pull off really complicated maneuvers, like the one that you've seen in the race car, but you want to do it in real time at like a kilohertz probably. So how can you do these types of things? We use a lot high performance computing. So for example, the drones that we have actually have GPUs on them. They fly GPUs. They fly like teraflop computers to be able to do these kind of things. We also use them offline. like the deep learning computers that you would use normally. We have access to things like DGX1 and so on that we use that to compute controllers, for example. Um, here's an example of, I don't know, like one GPU drone just kind of passing through a window. This is from a long time ago. But these are the controllers that we would compute on supercomputers that we would deploy. And on the perception side, for example, we're looking at things where like you can use visual machinometry. You can just have a camera and just look through the world from the camera and try to understand your own position. So we have certain algorithms to pick the features just right so that you can do these things with just like 10 features or something like that. So they're just computationally very efficient. Uh, on the systems aspects of things, and when you put them together, yeah. Sure. No. What, what exactly do you mean by, by computing controllers, like finding the best constants for a controller? Yeah, so this is maybe kind of, yeah. Um, so the question was, what do you mean by sort of computing the controllers? Would you want to find the best constants? So um, controllers are actually pretty complicated objects. So you have a drone. It has, suppose it has six, it has actually 12 degrees of freedom, but suppose it has six degrees of freedom. It's a six dimensional space. Six dimensional space is very, very large. Suppose you discretize every dimension with 200 points. So six dimensional position and orientation. 
200 points, 200 to the 6 would be thousands of trillions. If you were to write one byte for every point in the state, so you're looking at the state space, for every point in the state space, what's the action that I'm going to do? If I end up at that position and orientation, what action should I do? If you use one byte to write it in the memory, it would make 2.5 petabytes of this controller. It's pretty large. When you think about it, you don't really need, it would be very surprising if that maneuver really, to be able to describe it, like in information theoretic terms, to be able to describe it, it'd be very surprising if it requires thousands of trillions of parameters. I mean, how complicated is it, really? So millions maybe, but trillions, seriously? So what we do is, to be able to compute these things, we take very simple controllers, like for example, zero, don't do anything. We compress them, like as in data compression. And then we work on the compressed versions. And then that compressed version grows at to a level that comes down to something like two megabytes. That's probably essentially what you would need, rather than three terabytes, for example. We use kind of you know, singular value decomposition type techniques to do compression. You may have done the same thing using images, for example. Um, if you compress an image, JPEG, you save an order of magnitude. No surprise, right? If you compress video, you save two, three orders of magnitude because video is three-dimensional. As you increase the dimensions, there's more to compress. So when you compress this way, this saves 10 orders of magnitude, which honestly is no surprise when you think about it a little bit. So those are the control, like the planning and control algorithms that we use. These run on supercomputers still. So we compute them in, I don't know, five minutes. That gives you a lookup table that's two megabytes you put in so that you can quickly execute it. That lookup table is essential if you want to do a kilohertz control. You won't be able to compute a trajectory at that rate. Okay, that question came in and that's the whole talk in terms of present of motion planning and I can show you some other stuff. Um, and there's a lot to do, especially in terms of agility on the systems domain as well. Like, I don't know, I pulled up, this is not the kind of stuff that, the only stuff that we do, but I pulled up the most interesting thing, I think, maybe the most crazy thing off of my hard disk. Imagine you have a whole bunch of vehicles coming to an intersection. Suppose they're fully autonomous. Um, how would you make it so that they would pass through the intersection as fast as possible, okay? So if you were to really utilize algorithms that would do that, here is what it would look like. So you would have vehicles coming in, and you could, it looks like, so you probably don't want to sit in this vehicle. But just sort of like, just to understand the fundamental limits of the situation, just to understand how far you can push these things, you can see it looks like they're getting very lucky, but really what's happening is that they're just speeding and slowing down just so little so that they can avoid one another. So you can actually sit down and do some math and try to understand, you know, given the dynamics like your acceleration, deceleration limits, how fast you can push these things. Um, maybe it doesn't immediately apply to self-driving cars, but certainly you can use it in warehouses and things like that, which would actually improve operations quite a bit. I wonder if any of you have seen Kiva Systems warehouses, you look at it, most of the robots are stopped. They're just sitting there. Yeah, so the question is, is there anyone sort of working on robustness aspects of distributed control? Yeah, so that's a good point. It's, it's very right. Um, we have looked at things like, like from the theoretical perspective, it turns out that, um, like even in this case, um, there's something like a critical density of these things. So below the critical density, things are very simple. Um, you're gonna be robust, you're going to be able to find paths, and you're going to be able to execute. Above the critical density, things are very hard. It's very fragile, like if something fails, you just kind of, the whole system will crash into one another. Um, and this is no surprise either, like this is kind of the physics of many, you know, just like um, you see it everywhere. I mean, it's the same thing as, I don't know, you heat this thing, there's a critical temperature, above it, it looks different, below it, it looks um, like a liquid. Um, you can use the same kind of thinking or theoretical arguments to come up with these types of things. And I know that a lot of people work on specific controllers for vehicle level to guarantee robustness and so on. Uh, probably those are the kind of things that one needs to do before implementing these types of algorithms. Um, but what we're sort of, like in the current existing like multi-vehicle um, uh, setups, like Kiva systems or ports and things like that, we are far away from this kind of thing. Um, the main problem 
Some of it is control, like we don't understand the control aspects, but we also don't trust our sensors and things like that. So that's another big problem. So probably more of the research is on the, not research, but implementation is on the sensor side, I'd say. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, so we have been doing a number of other projects currently as well on autonomous vehicles. Um, if you're interested in any one of them, uh, let me know. I'm not gonna show you videos, but let me just kind of tell you with one slide and a few pictures. This was several slides, but I felt really bad. So, um, so we have an autonomous tricycle. Um, that may sound funny, um, but it's actually pretty hard to test with autonomous vehicles. So we currently have five of these, and we're hoping to build 30 um, so that we can put them in, and they're currently in a little robot town, like an enclosed area in Taiwan, and they're just driving around collecting data so that we can, for example, you can feed them into deep learning algorithms. Um, we also have in ABI's warehouses, we have, these, we have one of these robots. It's a warehouse robot. It's um, supposed to be kind of like, you know, I, I'm sure you know of WeThink Robotics. Like just, they make this robot arm. It's supposed to be very easy you can interact with. So imagine a warehouse robot that way. You can just talk to it. You can tell it stuff to do, and it can do that. You can show it. You can hop on it. You can do it yourself type of thing. I am also uh, a lead PI together with sort of uh, working with um, uh, Daniela Rus on um, MIT's uh, effort with Stanford and Toyota uh, to build safer vehicles. And finally, I'm still a PI on the MIT Singapore partnership. We are now from golf carts. We've moved into doing these electric vehicles and, and we're working on basically integrating a lot of electric vehicles together to, to make them uh, kind of work nicer. We've also kind of now looking into a, an autonomous uh, kind of a wheelchair that's also in that project that I didn't show here. Uh, so my group works on like a number of other projects in this domain. Um, admittedly, my group is, is a bit more on the theory side as well. So maybe like half the group is a bit theory oriented. The other half is more experimental. I usually say we have quite a spectrum in the group. So we would have mathematicians. Like I would have people who don't have any engineering degrees. Uh, like for example, we have one postdoc who is a mathematician by training, um, is a postdoc scholar here. We have um, undergrad two undergraduates, two graduate students whose undergraduate degrees are from mathematics. On the other hand, we have sort of mechanical engineers and so on who would actually build these things throughout the group and, and we're funded by a number of people um, throughout. So okay, um, that was supposed to be like a quick summary and entrance into what I was going to talk about. Um, so let me kind of tell you maybe our DARPA Urban Challenge effort so that I can tell you a little bit more about how we implemented these motion planning algorithms. Um, if time allows, I could talk more broadly about motion planning algorithms, but I don't think we'll get a chance to, okay? Um, so I'm going to start with this effort, uh, the DARPA Urban Challenge. I'm sure many of you have heard. Um, people usually believe that it kind of just kick-started of all this um, autonomous vehicles type bonanza that's been going on. Uh, let me introduce to you a little bit. So this is, um, was DARPA did things called DARPA Grand Challenge 1 and 2. I'll tell you in a second what they are, but this is the third one essentially. The idea is that you would take a street legal vehicle, you would instrument it with sensors and computers, and you would enter this race to drive 60 miles in under six hours in an urban traffic, where right? there's other vehicles driving around as well. So DARPA proposed this back in 2006. They did the race in November 2007. Um, the, it was pretty hard, you know, you would have to do a lot of different things like U-turns, K-point turns, you'd have to be careful with stop signs and so on. It's pretty complicated, but if you win it, they would give you $2 million, so it's a good incentive. Um, 89 teams entered the race. Um, we usually say it's MIT's first serious entry, but MIT's non-serious entry was, I guess, the, a team that later turned into cruise automation, which um, GM ended up buying for a billion dollars. So this is a serious one. Uh, of our entries. Um, they just went there to have fun, I think. Um, and then later they continued their interest in the autonomous cars and, and built cruise automation, did a great job. We went after, we were, were not directly connected to it, that team. Our team had mainly MIT faculty, postdocs, and students. So we had eight full-time graduate students, kind of roughly. I was one of them. You can see me right here. Um, I looked different back then. Um, we had a lot of support from Draper Laboratory, mainly on the sort of system integration, vehicle integration and support. Uh, some of them are in the audience. 
Um, and um, we also had some vehicle engineering support from Olin College. We had a first version of the vehicle where cables were coming out, and then Olin College came in and they packaged it nicely. We built a vehicle, it looked like this. We took a Land Rover LR3. Land Rover was one of the sponsors. Um, but also it was nice that the vehicle was pretty big. Um, we put an EMC drive by wire system to it. So this is kind of a drive by wire system for people who are disabled. Like for example, if you can't use your legs, they would give you like a little joystick type device so that you can actuate you know, gas and brake. So it came very handy. We used it to make our vehicle drive by wire. Um, we needed to put a lot of sensors on it, so um, I'm going to say this, I wish this wasn't recorded, but hey. Um, so I think our situation was the following. There was a lot of other teams out there and they were very experienced. They had done the other, urban, other grand challenges before and so on. We were not as experienced. I would say that our team was talented, but not experienced. And we had a lot of sponsors, so we had a lot of money. So our strategy turned into, if it fits on the vehicle, let's put it on the vehicle. And we'll figure out a way to use it. If we don't use it, it's dead weight, we'll just kind of carry it. So with that mindset, we ended up with five cameras, 16 radars, 12 planar laser scanners, one 3D laser scanner, and one GPS AMU unit. This was a lot of sensors. They generated a lot of data. You had to process it, so we had to buy a 40 CPU, 40 gigs of RAM, quanta computer, that normally at that time would run on like a Google server type thing. It was a server rack. 10 computers essentially that we had to put in. Um, so we, we used to joke that this was like the fastest mobile computer on campus or something like both in terms of speed and compute power. Um, now this required a lot of energy so we put on an internally mounted generator. Now this generates a lot of heat so we put an air conditioner on top. You can kind of see it here. So that became our vehicle. One thing to note, though, is that we just had the number of sensors was, or the number of computers was large, but, but the sensor suit was very similar to the other people who had finished. One important sensor was this 3D laser scanner that I'm going to show you in a second. So this is the thing that sits on top of the vehicle, looks like that Kentucky fried chicken type of bucket, and essentially what it has is that probably a lot of people here are familiar, but it has 64 lasers that measure range, and those 64 lasers are stacked up on a vertical plane, and that plane will turn in 15 hertz. So it will give you a 3D point cloud. If you drive with it in Harvard Square, here is what the raw data will look like. This is colored by height. You're just looking at raw data. And you can you know, easily pick up, I don't know, a bus here, another building, maybe a person, a bunch of others. So that it gives you great data already. Like, you could work with this, right? Um, so we taught. So other teams thought this sensor is made by a company called Velodyne. It came pretty much just in time for the urban challenge. My guess is that if you didn't have this 3D point cloud, it would be pretty hard to complete that challenge. There was only one team that didn't have it and completed, it, and they had a 2D laser scanner that was kind of turning like they essentially built their own Velodyne. Okay. So we had also this sort of 12 planar laser scanners, you would need these kind of things to cover the blind spots of the vehicle. The thing is on top, so you're not seeing kind of very nearby. We had five on the push brooms looking down and seven on the skirts. So this is kind of what it would look like. So you're seeing the curbs here and then you know, a bunch of other things and the vehicles are, when the vehicles are very close to you, you can still see them. We had 16 radars. Um, radars are great, they can see very far. Like laser scanners would see 70 meters, radars would see twice as much. The problem is that they have a very narrow field of view. So we needed 16 of them to cover 27 degrees around the vehicle, 207 degrees around the vehicle, 270 degrees. So you know you can park somewhere and you can see this is meters per second. You can see a whole bunch of other vehicles kind of coming through. Uh, helps quite a bit. And finally, we had five cameras in this configuration. We were using cameras to actually look at lane markings. I think actually we were the only finishing team that was using cameras for any purpose of any kind. The other vehicles were just kind of working with the laser scanner. I mean, we were mainly working with the laser scanner, but we were picking up lane markings with this. And we bought this GPS AMU unit. It was an expensive thing, but it would give you your position you would go with. Um, the algorithmic stack, it gets pretty complicated. Um, I think by the end of the race, we would probably have, like, the active code that was running could be order hundreds of thousands of lines of C code. 
So maybe like 200,000 could, I mean, I remember the forklift and that was about half a million lines of code. I think this was a bit less. We had around like 100 processes that are running, sending messages to one another on that 40 core system that you've seen. So that would generate a huge software diagram. So I simplified it for you. It turned into this. Um, you have some sensors, you get that data, you process it through perception algorithms, you generate a map of the environment close to the robot. And you have this three-tier stack, you have a navigator, much like your Google Maps, it would compute a map to get to your next goal, which may be kilometers away, and it would also give you the, right, the next waypoint that you should hit that would hopefully be within your grid map. And there's a motion planner that looks at the map, sees all the obstacles and everything, sees the goal point, and finds a path to get to the goal point using the RRT. And then once that trajectory is computed, it is passed to a controller that actually steers the vehicle that way. So I've already shown you how the motion planner works. It just kind of computes these things. So here's the goal point. Our car finds a path to get there. <coughs> and you can run these things together to, to get like a good behavior. Um, it doesn't always go well. Um, let me show you what doesn't work in this kind of market. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, could you also mention uh, how you guys tested the algorithm or the algorithm performance aspects of your software? And also, like, for example, uh, when did you actually, you know, test all the bugs? Like, you know, did you get to everything in the field? Or, like, do you have... Yeah, so we, we had, like, um, honestly, so, so here are a couple of honest things. So we, we had, one thing is that we had a pretty good simulation system going. Um, for motion planning and things like that, it helped a lot. Like on the day of the, on the sort of like the, the day before the race, my 24-7 job was to keep simulating our algorithms. Like I had two computers, kind of start simulation here, start there, look at it. If one fails, log it and, and send it out. So simulation really helped. We had done some testing, but I don't think we actually, I think the race itself was the furthest that we had driven without any human intervention. Like before then, we hadn't done that much. I think this was like 60 miles. If I remember this correctly, we had done like a 20 mile stretch or something like that, but we hadn't done as many. Um, so admittedly, we didn't have too much on the testing front um, going. The only reason why was because it's just we didn't have time to do this kind of thing. We, so, I mean, we started maybe a year before that we put together some of the infrastructure, like this message sending and things like that. Uh, but the vehicle itself, to test it in reality, the vehicle, I think the race was in November. We probably got this vehicle, I mean, we had another vehicle before, but we got this one clean, I think it was April. And then we put the sensors on or something like that. So really, it was just the summertime that we had to test, and admittedly, we couldn't test much. Um, and Draper Laboratory helped out a lot with the testing. If we didn't have that, we probably wouldn't test any. So we'd probably just kind of fail outright or something. In this kind of thing, testing is very important. It'll be very important for future as well. Uh, simulation will be very important. Simulation has come a long way, actually. Like nowadays, you can, I mean, you guys are working with simulators, you can see, but there's a lot of other things that people are going to put out in the next year or two, and, and you know, like, we can nowadays render things that you can show it to people, and it's very hard to, like, people don't see that it's a rendering. Ours wasn't back then. I think that would be probably the right thing to do right now. But back then we had this one platform that, you know, you could just run the whole software stack. But if you start out a simulator, it would actually simulate all the sensor data and everything. Um, if you don't start a simulator, then the processes would be waiting for the data to come in. So you could put it on a real vehicle or something. So back then we thought that would be the best thing to do. Uh, the question was, um, was your simulated environment and your development environment separate or integrated? They were very integrated. Right now, I think you would do things differently. Any other questions? Yeah, there's kind of a lot to talk about, so I thought that it would be just kind of great to give you guys some ideas, given the, the courses and autonomous vehicles. Um, so here's an example um, of a case that we got into. Um, so. What's happening here is we arrive at an intersection, and there's another car, it's Cornell's car, and they're just sitting right in the middle of the intersection. 
and they don't seem to be moving. I think they've been sitting there for a few minutes before we even arrived. So DARPA decided that they should let us go, and we're probably going to take over, and we'll do great. And it's going to be an important moment in robotics history that for the first time, you know, a robot takes over another robot while the other robot is stuck, and it's going to be great. So they decide to go forward with this. So here is how we're seeing things from inside our car. Our car is right here, wants to go there. Our RT generates trajectories. There's an object here. That's the car that we're seeing. We're not seeing all of it, but we're seeing enough fraction of it. So we're going to play it a little bit. Um, so you know, like we were actually able to turn around it. So I, I think I need to stop it somewhere. But uh, let's look at here. So we've seen the whole car. The new goal point is further away. We're generating these trajectories. Looks great. It turns out that this car is just somehow stuck for some reason. So we wrote a paper together with them. It's not unclear to them either, but my understanding is that they think that the obstacle is on top of the car. And the way the algorithm is written is it just kind of generates a trajectory and asks if this trajectory is collision free or not. Right? The collision checker doesn't say this part of the trajectory is in collision. It's just every time it passes a trajectory because the route is in collision, it just says, you know, there's nothing there. They have another little piece where it just updates the map every time there's new information from the sensors. If there's no new information, there's no need to update. So they ended up getting stuck on this obstacle, and they're not refreshing their map because nothing is moving. Up until we move right next to them, they refresh again, and they say, oh, I'm actually not sitting on an obstacle. That was an error. So the next time the path comes, going forward, it says, this is a great path. Go forward with it. That happens right when we're passing. So if you look at this blob right now, as I play it, the blob starts to move. So they are going in a direction that we are going. Um, a quick thing will happen. So if, if our car, if our car at some point realizes that there's no paths, a collision is imminent, and there's nothing to do about it, it generates, it shows that white circle um, around it. Um, and that basically means that we are headed to a crash. There's nothing we can do about it. We're just going to slam the brakes and hope not too bad things happen. Uh, so it starts to do that. I think at this time, this camera is more fun to look at. You can kind of take a look at it and sort of see what happened. And so this kind of like collision happens. Um, we collide with the car. Um, DARPA, what they did is that they actually pulled the Cornell car back. They started us. We finished. They finished as well. Uh, so both of the teams finished. But you can see some of the things that are a little bit hard. For example, if you yourself were to arrive at an intersection, that there's a car that's sitting there, you probably would stop your car, take out, go and ask if there's anything wrong. Uh, even if you don't do that, suppose you're not very decent of a human being, you don't you decide not to do that, uh, you would still steer away from that car. You probably wouldn't get as close to this car as we did. So there are some problems that are at the inference level that we do without even thinking. Um, and it's, it's actually kind of hard things for these types of cars to do. Especially if you're going fast, you're in a complicated environment, you're not expecting things, and you might collide into things. We do different kinds of inference that we can't even name, but you know, you look at the way a person walks on the sidewalk, and you can say, oh, you know, this person is kind of dangerous, or maybe we will walk into the street or not. You know, you make that decision, and it's actually a pretty complicated thing for a robot to do. Okay, so you know, um, this is kind of like the results of the race. I'm not going to go too much into it. Basically, the idea is that 89 people started, six finished. We were one of the finishers. CMU came first, so they got the $2 million check, I believe. Stanford came second. They got a $1 million check. Virginia Tech came third. They got half a million. We came fourth. We didn't get any money. Um, but you know, we got a lot of experience. It was great to be a part of it, I think. One note is that the Google car that you may have heard a lot was essentially sort of like a spin-off from this race. So if you look at the Google car, you will see that the sensing package is very similar. It's very laser scanner oriented, has a couple of radars on it uh, that it could utilize, and is working somewhat with the cameras, but not so much. Essentially, Google engineered this thing that we built, or all the other teams built independently. Uh, they engineered it for 10 years, and that's the kind of thing that they utilize nowadays. There's also like this whole Tesla brand of camera-based cars or deep learning and so on that's coming in uh, just very recently. Back 10 years ago, you know, we knew about deep learning and so on, but it just, it just didn't work. The moment somebody figured out doing it on a GPU, it started working pretty well. 
Okay, so there's a lot I can tell you about path planning, but I think um, here is kind of maybe what I should do if you, if you do not mind. Um, rather than telling you about RRTs and making this into a lecture that I'm not sure if you're gonna like it, um, let me talk maybe a little bit more about self-driving vehicles, and I think that's something that we might enjoy better. Um, so the question is sort of building it from scratch, what was the biggest challenge? So I'm going to say, um, admittedly, I was a junior student back then. So my challenge was to get these controllers and, and some parts of the RRT working. And I had simulation systems and things like that, and life was good for me. Um, I would think that, I mean, we ended up building pretty complicated hardware. So that was one of the challenges. Um, and that probably all in college, Draper, you know, they did all of that, that was great. The other challenge that we had is that nowadays there's like maybe you guys use it like robot operating system and so on, uh, that infrastructure software. We had none of that. So we ended up building our own. I don't know if anybody uses, but there's this thing called uh, Lightweight Communications and Marshalling, LCM. So that ended up being built for this and, and it just kind of got spun out. That was another big challenge that we actually faced. So LCM nowadays is, is utilized throughout the industry. Like for example, Ford Autonomous Cars will use it. Toyota will use it, Nutanami uses it. Um, so it ended up coming out of this, this challenge. And it was probably like the first, you know, I would say the first six, seven months was kind of devoted to it. Um, and, and for necessity, I mean, we just, we wanted to do other things, but we just couldn't because you needed something like this. So that was another big challenge, I would say. Um, testing was a big challenge, things like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, <clears throat> Uh, back then in the Urban Challenge days, it seemed like people were pretty collaborative um, as far as working on autonomous vehicles goes. You published papers, you published a paper with, uh, for the collision with the <coughs> other team and things like that. But now it seems like autonomous vehicle development is becoming much more isolated, like different companies competing and not collaborating. I mean, is, is that going to be good? Is that going to be like, you know? Yeah, I mean, um, well, it's, I guess it's good and bad. It's kind of hard to assess. So. Uh, competition is always good. Um, so the, the, the question was that, um, you know, back in the day, we were really collaborative. Like, it's very interesting that we actually wrote a paper with Cornell uh, about our collision, just to teach the whole community why these kind of things happen. But nowadays, like, everybody is just kind of doing their own thing, and there's no uh, kind of going out. So there's a, there's a quick question, there's a quick answer for that, and there's a kind of a broader answer. So the quick answer is that, um, yeah, I mean, it became important. There's a lot of, you know, sort of um, people invested a lot of money and they are expecting returns and things like that and that affects the environment. Um, that definitely drove it. Um, I, I think we're still, you know, trying to work on it in academia and trying to publish papers. But a lot of people are, you know, worried about competing with these huge companies and things like that, which I, I think is not a big worry because there's a lot to do still. Um, so when, when you look at the industry, there's little competition. Um, but that, for some reason, the broader answer is that that became a norm. So back 50 years ago, you would look at the, the top company of the day. This is like starting from a century ago, like with Bell, for example. They would form labs and they would publish and they'd do science and things like that. It would be very open. And nowadays, the big companies of the day, they kind of rather prefer secretive labs and, and things like that. Um, so that, I think Microsoft was the last big company of the day to do that. Nowadays, Googles and Apples and things like that, they don't do that anymore. There's a bit of that as well, um, good or bad. But it became that way. And sometimes competition is good, honestly. It's a good thing that people um, feel like you don't know what the others are doing and you want to compete. So that makes you better and better, even though the others maybe are not, I don't know. OK, any other questions? Yeah. Maybe a vision only urban challenge or, or something that raises the best chance of more <coughs> of driving engaged versus purely an industry problem. Now. 
I, I'm not sure. I don't think it's purely an industry problem because it's it's still kind of it's it's quite complicated, honestly. Um, so there may be things that people can do, but I, I, I am wondering if DARPA would be interested in doing a challenge. So let's set DARPA aside differently and, and research otherwise. Like when you think about DARPA, DARPA is a defense um, agency, and when they thought about the challenge, they had honestly defense problems in mind. So for example, they didn't allow you to go around and drive in the area with your sensors. The idea was that they would give you a map of the environment 24 hours in advance, and then five minutes before, they would give you a mission, like hit this waypoint, hit that waypoint, and so on. So that's a military setting. They were really, it really, the whole thing started with the US Congress mandate to get you know, one third of combat vehicles autonomous by 2015, which didn't happen, but it was a more military setting. Um, so DARPA is usually sort of that minded, and they did the DARPA robot challenge. The current thing is thing called fast lightweight autonomy, so the idea is to build a quadcopter that can fly here 20 meters a second, like 40 miles an hour in indoor environments type of thing. I think they'll do that. But there may be other things, like there may be other you know, people kind of coming in, pushing the boundary of research. Like something, for example, just with cameras would be very interesting. And I think we are just in a, we may be a couple years away from doing that very well, I think. And probably deep learning would be a lot of it. Okay, so um, I don't have much time, and I don't want to hold you here, um, but sort of, you know, let, let me tell you a few things about autonomous cars in general, and let's see if we can, you know, in like 10 minutes we can fit something interesting. Um, transportation is, is a very interesting thing. Um, it actually defines how you live quite a bit. So if you look at, for example, the kind of cities that, you know, many of you may be living in today, they look like this. And they are produced thanks to one invention that was the affordable car, which was about a century ago. If you look at it, you know, throughout the last century, like in 1950s, cars were big, and, and you would find, you know, that everywhere these kind of suburbs were being constructed for the first time. The reason was cities were dirty, they were disease prone, so now you had the car, you could move away into a better living lifestyle, and it would improve it, and that was the 20th century invention that you had. It also changed the cities quite a bit. I mean, like, for example, this is uh, Boston's sort of central artery that was built in, you know, 50s at around that time to kind of service the cars coming in and out of the city. Um, the cars kind of generated this kind of thing, you know, in some places at the extreme, like if you go to places like Los Angeles in the United States, you would see the suburban sprawl. Um, it's very different in other places. So places that didn't have the time to expand that didn't have the resources to expand or just didn't have the place to expand, um, it caused many problems. Like here is the suburbia in, in Mexico City. You can see the dirt that it generates in the distance. Even if you're rich, it doesn't really matter. You know, even in, in rich countries, this quick expansion, it just doesn't work and it, it creates, if anything, just ugly environments. Um, and in some places, it creates, like you need to be dense and you need to be big um, and so you have the cars, but um, you just have to build you know, big buildings that you cannot even serve with cars. So you generate these type of things where, you know, like there's a, I think it's probably my, I'm just, I was just gonna say it only led to congestion and pollution in the rest of the world, but um, it generated these kind of things where, I don't know if you heard, there was a traffic jam in China. It lasted like nine days and it was 100 miles long. Um, so it generated this kind of thing. It's just the quick introduction of the affordable car sort of what it did to the environment in the cities there. Um, so pollution is one problem and so on, but um, if you look through it, it's actually pollution and energy consumption wise, a lot of it comes from the cars, especially inside the cities. Um, an interesting point is that if you look through the cars, the cars are actually pretty inefficient the way they sort of sit currently. Um, if you look through, for example, BMWs over the years, you would see that they get heavier and they get faster. This is very correlated. If you get faster, you have to become heavier because you have to pass crash tests and things like that. So you know, you're, in order just to be faster. Um, so in order to pass, to pass the crash tests, you build structure and things like that, and that makes the vehicle heavier uh, ultimately. So like a BMW that you would buy in the 70s would weigh something like you know, 2,500 pounds. Nowadays, it's like, you know, um, like 4,000 pounds, roughly. So it would, you know, if you look at the average passenger weight that it's carrying, it's about 25 times 
the, the weight of the passengers. Um, and the size as well, you know, it's about 10 times the size of the passengers that it carries. Um, in terms of parking spots, if you look through the cities, um, there are places in the, you know, usually what we have in the United States is that for every car we have two parking spots. So roughly that's the number. In some places, parking spots take up like half the city. So for example, in LA. Um, on average, it's about one third. So you might ask the question like, this is the kind of thing, this is the kind of environment that cities created, and do you really want to live in this type of environment? And it's to kind of give you the idea, I mean, if you, if you walk out, a lot of the infrastructure, a lot of the things that you see are made by cars. Like for instance, and it really uh, kind of interferes with your thinking as well. So for instance, um, we never walk on the street nowadays. Like nobody jaywalks. The streets are for cars. Like cars go on the streets and we go on the sidewalk. It wasn't like that 100 years ago. You could walk on the streets however you wanted. Cars came in and they took it over. Uh, so they changed the urban landscape quite a bit. The point is that it seems like there's, um, there's an opportunity today to actually um, kind of use 21st century technologies. This could be robotics, but a number of other things like online services, new business models, and things like that, uh, and so on, maybe high performance computer or whatever, and to kind of service the needs of people in the cities. So what happens to the economy? Um, I'm not sure. I don't think the, the kind of the service um, aspects of it goes away. So you know, you will need to prop my guess what would happen is that I think um, people could be more mobile. So I think they want to be more mobile, but they're just not. If it was very accessible, very easy, I think they would be. So um, there'd be an increase in being mobile, but at the same time, that's a, you know, resources are spent on it, you need to pay for it somehow. So you would still generate economic activity off of that. In fact, you would probably generate more economic activity. For example, if the moment you change people's behavior, there's the way that you generate like a new economic activity. So if, if there's a way, for example, transportation is more available, more affordable, and it changes their behavior, it makes you more mobile. Like for example, you're, you're fine with having a class here and then 20 minutes later having a class at Harvard. Nobody would do that nowadays. But if it was that easy to get there, you would probably do it. And so that would make you more mobile. And that's the way ultimately it would generate more economic activity rather than buying cars. I mean, the service is still there. You need to pay for it somehow. Any other questions? Um, yeah, so the point is that you, know, you can use these type of technologies to do, for example, like either maybe like mobility on demand, you know, whenever you need to be mobile, you can be mobile, or deliver things and so on. Um, and I think that, let me just kind of, um, I was gonna tell you a bit the history, but I think that I'm just going to um, pass it and, and, and tell you a few things. Um, so autonomous vehicles are sort of one thing that you can utilize and you can actually do these types of things. Um, I think you can make this even better. Like for example, you can integrate a few things into it. One thing you can integrate sharing, like so you can make it in an Uber type scenario. You can use autonomy as well. And finally, like electrification, especially if you're going a little bit slower, um, so you don't have to pass, pass crash, crash tests and things like that, you could really reduce the cost of transportation. Like to the point where you could imagine things like, like you could go from anywhere to anywhere else for 99 cents in Boston with like five minute wait time. If you want to share your ride, it could be 50 cents. If you want to admit to like one stop, a lot of us do one stop. You know, you can take a subway and then take a bus. One stop makes your transportation much cheaper if you were to take an airplane. Suppose if you wanted to take one stop, you could pay 30 cents and you could go anywhere to anywhere else in Boston. I think there's a good opportunity to kind of, you know, push for things and, and, and utilize technology to bring the cost of transportation to a point, or availability of transportation to a point, to like really just change a lot of things. Um, it's not very easy. The way I usually look at the technological landscape is that you can imagine sort of speed versus complexity. Speed is the speed of the vehicle that's being involved, that's involved in this, and, and maybe complexity is the complexity of the environment that you're dealing with. Like you can have high speed, low complexity environments like highways, they're actually easy to work with. We might actually conquer them like in the next, I don't know, three years or something like that. Um, another thing would be like, for example, parks or university campuses or something much slower, but much more complex, like people walking around and, and, and things like that. 
fully autonomous driving is probably pretty far, but there is some opportunity to do some interesting things um, elsewhere very quickly. The, one of the problems is that um, this is not just a technology problem, to be honest. As you have seen earlier, there's a lot of involvement in, like, for example, architecture. Like, how do you actually utilize the city the best and so on. But one of the biggest problems ends up being this law and, and insurance and regulations aspects. Um, there are good or bad things. Like, for example, sometimes you allow by the law to be able to do certain things. But then is it really like, um, is it a safety hazard? Is it even ethical to kind of allow people to just kind of test stuff around? So it's a bit of a question, like whether or not this is the kind of thing. I think sort of going forward, if I could say one thing to you guys, is that this is, this is just not like a, just a problem in, in sort of um, technology, but it's also like a problem in technology, sort of society, policy, architecture, law, insurance, and business as well. Like you may need new business models and so on. So I personally think that the, it's, it's right out there. But I think that we still need just a bit of more, like a better thinking to do, to be able to attack this problem and to really kind of enable it so that you can uh, kind of do good and interesting things with it. Um, I might, I could close with a couple things. Uh, one thing is that I was going to talk a little bit more, but um, uh, maybe I'll just kind of pass with one slide. Um, I am a part of a, a new company. I've done a few companies outside, so this is the latest thing that we've been working on. Uh, it's called Optimus Ride. It's working on autonomous vehicles. It's currently in stealth mode. It just raised like a little more than $5 million in seed round uh, to kind of start its operations. Um, I am joined, so the founding team includes a number of sort of friends. Uh, Ryan Chin, for example, I don't know if you guys have heard of the uh, MIT city car, this folding car. Um, that was his doctoral thesis. Uh, he's been an MIT PI for a while. He joined Optimus. Albert Huang is a friend of mine who we worked together in the Urban Challenge. He was later um, a, a sort of a chief architect, software architect at Rethink Robotics, then the lead perception engineer at Google X for Project Wing, and then he joined Optimus. Ramiro Almeida is a, is a sort of a designer, so he's um, a Leo fellow from the Harvard Graduate School of Design, um, has this Leo fellowship. They would invite eight mid-career, you know, best mid-career designers so he has that kind of a background. He also built Quito's subway system, raised $2 billion for it. Um, Jenny Larios Berlin is also a, a joint MBA and, a, and an urban planning master's from MIT. Uh, she was the managing director of uh, university campus operations of Zipcar. Uh, so we kind of started this kind of thing and, and thinking about these types of problems. If you're interested, send me an email. Um, we'll be happy to talk to you more about it. I also will tell you one more thing. Um, I am advising a team that's trying to do um, Formula SAE autonomously. They're doing it for the first time this year. Uh, they're actually using a lot of deep learning type algorithms. So we're not, I was telling them, I'm not really sure if with deep learning you're going like, to literally win it because people <coughs> might come with all the heuristics and things like that. But I think you, know, you may win it at, at people's hearts just so that your only algorithm is deep learning or something like that. So they're doing that. If you're interested, please send an email to autonomous dash f formula SAE, FSAE, at MIT.edu, and they're working on a number of things. You're more than welcome to join them. Thank you so much. That's all I have. It's exactly one hour. Yeah, sure. I'm here. Um, yeah, uh, so maybe a few questions, uh, if anybody has questions. So the, a lot of this class is about deep learning, and uh, in terms of autonomous vehicles, deep learning is mostly focused on the vision sensor on cameras. So how far are we away from a car that safely navigates the streets of Boston without LIDAR and without any mapping? So purely on the sensors, using the sensors and perception. So it's a bit of a guess game, to be honest. So I, it wasn't somewhat the slides that I kind of passed through, but um, I am a big believer in computer vision. Um, and I, I do not think it's too far away. It just ends up being a bit of a guess game, but um, it's not like, I don't know if, how many of you have worked with cameras, but deep learning is one approach. You can also use geometric approaches. Like you can use a single camera and the motion of the car to build a 3D map of an environment. These are not too far away. Cameras are actually pretty good sensors. 
The only problem with cameras is that they, it's just a lot of data. And there's little information in it. You need to fish it out. So you need computers to accompany it. Um, it seems like the computers are coming out. Um, so it's still hard to know. But I, like, I would be surprised if in 10 years you can't build a car that just has a bunch of cameras and navigates with cameras, period. It would be very surprising to me. It'd be also surprising if it happens next year, uh, like some people are saying. Uh, but in between these, I, you know, I, I would think you would be able to. So once you, like what I would suggest is, if any of you is working with cameras, I would suggest deep learning is an excellent technique. So once you, I think you're kind of using it here, and I'm sure you're being surprised as, as, as it gives you the kind of information that you need. Try out model-based techniques as well. They're also coming along pretty well. So probably a solution that just integrates them as best as possible would be viable, I would guess, in three to five years. I'd be surprised otherwise. It's optimistic. OK, anybody have questions? Yes, the question was, in autonomous intersections, what role the communication plays? If you wanted to do crazy things that, like I've shown you, uh, you need to make sure everything communicates with everything else. Um, that would break pretty badly if you don't do it. Um, I would actually imagine that like, um, one interesting thing to quickly do would be to have cars communicate with each other to do some interesting things, like not just maybe intersection, but lane following and things like that. Like, there are a few things that you may see pretty quickly with autonomous cars, but pretty quickly, I mean, three to five years. So this could be um, either V2V related, so communicate with other vehicles, vehicle to infrastructure related. I mean, you could, like, the deep learning and things like that, you could put up a camera on an infrastructure and people could tune into it. The biggest problems are cybersecurity, to be honest, to deploy these things. And on the autonomous vehicles end, you could see things like, maybe not with communication, you could see either sharing, like, you know, you have a button, you press, you time share, or you can have sharing with, you know, um, like, for example, you can use autonomy technology for safety, so that's a different type of sharing. Or you can find autonomous vehicles in isolated environments. So there's stuff that you can do with communication. I think you can quickly see lane following and maybe not intersections, but things like that. And with autonomy, there are certain things that we might see, but they don't involve communication at all. I think that's what would happen. All right, let's uh, give Sartash one more uh, Thank time. Thank you.